All right, we are live. What's up, Joanne? Hi, Sophia. Hey. Also, I don't. I can't see the chat. Oh, bummer. Well, I'll just imagine there's ten thousand people there. Hey, everybody. You can yeah, sign into the chat if you want to make another window. Oh yeah, sweet. Let's let's do mm -hmm. that. Okay. So, hi everybody. Welcome to another edition of Creative Exchange. Today is a very special one because I'm here with my brother, actual brother. I call everybody brother. He's actually my brother and room and everything. And uh, so Daniel's here, also known as Samuel Hope. He's uh, calling in from Spain. Yeah. Um, the land of naps and excellent food <laughs> and other yeah. things. Um, and today we're going to be talking about some of the things that, uh, you know, we, we, we'd we like to talk. My mom used to get so mad in the car. Like, why do you guys pick apart the music? Why can't you just enjoy it? We said, that's how we enjoy it. We pick it apart and oh that melody's cool oh that snare drum sounds good oh they stole that record change from there you know that's just the way that we've always enjoyed music ever since we were kids so um so we're gonna talk about that and uh i'm live on the hi so i was like hi uh i'm we're, li we're live here on creative exchange if you want to write in a question or a comment or anything just let me know and i'll pass it on and we're going to be talking to, to, to Daniel for a while about whatever he wants to tell us about. So um, first, what's new? Yeah, uh, I don't know. I'm musically not a whole lot, but I'm, I'm having a baby. That's new. <laughs> hold on, hold on. You broke up. Can you say that again? Work. Oh, no, I said musically not a whole. I'm going to close the other window. I opened a second window, but I think it was a bad idea. Uh, I was saying that I, um, not musically, not a whole lot is new, but that I'm having a baby in sometime within the next seven to eight weeks, maybe or so. So, yeah, pretty exciting. Very exciting. Very exciting. Number one parent tip: get as much sleep now as you want. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying. Because you'll, 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 uh, you'll, yeah, it's it becomes a thing. But, and how's Carly doing? She's good. Yeah, huge. Excited. Yeah, yeah, we're really, we're really excited. Um, it's just uh, how much space you got really on your on your phone to be, to be so pregnant when it's so hot out. It's really, really hot out here right now. Yeah, yeah. Jane was pregnant through the summer with both kids, but not as pregnant, right? Our kids were born a month early in November and December, so she was yeah. what six, five, and both years I was on tour most of the summer, and I should said. I'm so glad you didn't have to be here because it's hot and humid and it's just, it's very uncomfortable. <laughs> She'd come home every day and just lay on the bed with like cold, wet towels on and the dogs, you know? And, um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty rough. Are you guys, is it humid over there or is it kind of? It's no, normally even. it's not, but lately we had a particularly, uh, unpleasant, uh, summer so it's been pretty bad sometimes we get we're really close to Africa so you can see on a on a clear day you can see straight across the Mediterranean Sea and you see the mountains um, and it's when the wind comes from there it's awful it goes from oh I can't do the conversion anymore but it go it goes from like 29 or 30 Celsius to like 40 plus which is multiplied by 1.8 plus 32 whatever that is 80, 100, 100, 110, something like that, 105. It's really hot. Right now, it's, it's, it's bad, but it's it's pretty bad. That sounds, yeah, anything after 80, and I'm starting to, like, question my, uh, you know, my, 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 how soon can I get somewhere where it's colder? <laughs> or how long is it going to be? So yeah. Um, yeah, and and um, as they say, it's a it's a dry heat in in Arizona. Um, here it's it's pretty humid. Is it humid there? Like like rainy time or from here from no, like New Jersey? It doesn't really it doesn't really rain here that much. But um, no, it's it's lately it's been more humid than usual. We were we went driving. We did like our last um, what's it called uh, kind of road trip before the baby all over the country, all the way up to the north. And on our way back down, as you go inland from here, it's dry. And it'll be 120 degrees, but dry. So as long as you don't move, you're kind of okay. But right. once you move 
you just you dehydrate and you don't even notice it. It's weird. You don't sweat, right. but you are constantly dehydrating. <laughs> right. Uh, recently, I was uh, you know emptying out part of my car and I found one of those um, you know spray sunblocks that I keep all over for the kids and stuff, especially for you know yeah. this time of year. And and um, I think one of the kids was like, "Why do you have that in here?" I said, "You know, I probably shouldn't leave it in here." I use it, you know, sometimes they said, why shouldn't you leave it in here? I said, because they say on the bottle that at certain temperatures, you know, it could explode. Now, I've never yeah. heard of that happening here. But then I, I mentioned it to Jane. It's like, is that the kind of thing that happens when it's over 100 degrees in Arizona? She goes, all the time. That's, that's, yeah. that's, that's who they're talking about. Because it could be 110 yeah. or something and things melt. There's a certain hour of the yeah. day where you don't go outside. It's it's like uh like a like being on Star Wars or something. The planet just is gonna burn. So yeah, it's pretty crazy. But otherwise you don't get snow, right? Oh no, definitely well actually weirdly, last winter there's uh there are some mountains near here and they got their first dusting of snow in like seventy years. And then the hmm. year before we got a hailstorm that were like pellets like that big of ice. Uh, which had also never happened ever. So it's it's a bit weird. Weather's been weird, but no, normally it's temperate all the time. It's you know warm to hot and uh, three hundred some odd plus days of sunshine. Wow, man! It's like so well, that's California. cool. Yeah. Right. 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 So you don't miss yeah. snow then much? Actually, I do. Yeah, I haven't seen it in like besides that little bit. I haven't seen it. I made a six inch tall snowman that day and with forced perspective, I stood really far away and tried to make it look like it was six, six, seven feet tall. But, uh, it, oh. you can get it <laughs> that's great, man. Um, yeah, I mean, every year I'm less and less interested in shoveling snow, but yeah, you're, you're going to dig this. I this don't miss, last like, the, the dirty snow at all. Right. But, like, right. Well, th this, this last clean. winter, yeah, yeah. Um, we got sleds. You know, I, I got these sleds from Sophia and David um, that were in the garage. And they're like boogie boardy ones. So I took the kids to where we used to go in Leonia um, by the pool. And that thing was like an ice sheet. I mean, way down, they banged into the fence and it was great. But there's a spot in town here where there's one like that. It's a little less steep and much longer. So it's two really big ones in the back of the the field behind one of the middle schools and we probably went like every other day now they're in yeah. that phase and for my birthday in march we went snow tubing which was oh, cool. cool yeah that jane set that up it was at one of the uh the water parks has it so yeah that's the and now that they're at that age i'm i'm back to enjoying snow because that's the kind of stuff we used to do we skied a little bit bella learned to rollerblade this week and so did sophia oh, yeah, Sophia awesome. wanted to do it. She got blades. And last week we did a little, and then Bella really wanted to. So, you know, we cool. started a couple days ago. She's good at it. Um, that's the only sporty stuff I ever did, though, skiing and and, and ice or, or rollerblading. Because we took skating lessons once. Oh, yeah. Did I, ever did I ever tell you about the Zamboni machine, the thing I, I – when – remember when they would clean off the ice, right? Yeah. We would, We'd skate and they'd make everybody leave every hour for five minutes or whatever this Zamboni machine. Well, I remember one time standing and waiting with all the kids and I didn't know what the name of that machine was. I just thought it was the ice machine, whatever. So I'm, I'm looking and I see there's this big slat, like just carved right out of the side. And I just went, well, how did that happen? Did someone do that? And some kid just turns to me and goes, because it's sat and I goes, Zamboni. And I'm thinking there's a guy named Zamboni that like, goes so fast, he destroys holes along the wall. <laughs> and yeah. People are just like, it's Zamboni. You don't talk to Zamboni. I'm like, okay, Zamboni. Yeah. What a guy. Yeah. Oh. So I, la I later come to find that's the machine. Gabagool. Right. <laughs> 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 All right. So, uh, so, so, be so for everybody to know, Daniel's also the funniest person I've ever met. He has this way of like, it's like, it's like a tickle. As soon as he knows I'm laughing, he just keeps pushing the button. I just keep <laughs> laughing. If I start cackling and choking. Don't worry. It's, it's totally normal. Yeah. And we haven't laughed in a while. Yeah. We haven't gotten to talk much in a while. So we may go off on a tangent into the laugh world. But for now, I was, uh, I was I wanna... trying to open the stream on my phone so I can see people's comments. But it's uh, 
it keeps telling me, oops, looks like something went wrong. And so I can't do it. So I don't know if people are commenting or anything, but in case they do. Uh, oh, sorry. yeah, I, I can tried see opening it. another window. It wasn't I working. can see, and it, there's probably about a minute or so delay, not even. Right now we got Joanne Clark said hello. Sophia, our sister, said hello. Sarthak uh, said hello. He's one of the guys that works at, at Creative Exchange. And uh, right now it says 117 are watching. So hello to you all. Okay, uh, but so, I'll yeah, keep you. I'll cool. keep you posted. You know, the last the last interview I did was with with uh with Carmen in Spain, and since she yeah. lives in a cave, um, yeah, and I had to go a, down like town. Yeah, it was it was tricky. Where all the all the gypsy musicians come from. Oh, really? Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, they actually do live in caves. They they cut it into the cave and then they they like fill it out. Uh, I don't know with what concrete or whatever. They, yeah. And then they, they live, because it's, it's nice and cool in there and warm in the winter. It's right. actually really nice because it gets super yeah. hot there in the summer. It's mm -hmm. unbearable. So you go in a cave, bada bing, you're fine. Gobble yeah, bing. yeah. I was I, I did not get a chance to ask what the water, like, plumbing situation is, but otherwise it looked like pretty nice camping. Sophia and I went walking around there, actually. Uh, I took her to Granada, and we mm -hmm. went walking around the middle of nowhere and you go from a mountainy kind of neighborhood with houses and in the back it's just looks like rolling hills and then as you walk you realize inside those hills are cave houses and they're just all squatters basically who've who set up their own plumbing and electricity they've got everything now um but they've been there for a lot of them have been there for so long they uh they'll charge you they'll charge you triple to go see a flamenco show in a cave because it sounds cooler nice yeah, I was yeah, wondering how, how did it... Some of them are really people who live in caves. But yeah, right. I imagine Carmen is going to be from like one of those legit, one of those families that's lived there for forever. Yeah, well, she, I, I always knew she was, she was from a gypsy family or, you know, I, is that an insult? I'm, I'm, I'm totally dumb. No, I don't know. No, that's... Like they call it Gitano and they're very, they're usually pretty proud to be where they're from and the music. Okay. Like right. they grow up. Uh, I tried learning, I tried learning about flamenco from a Gitano singer guy. Um, and I didn't understand a word he said. And then, uh, and I speak Spanish. Spanish. I didn't understand anything he was saying. And then, um, yeah, it was pretty wild because it's like the way they explain things didn't make any sense. It wasn't using musical terms I'm familiar with. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it really, I really struggled to understand. And then I know some guys who've kind of done the crossover between like jazz and flamenco and they can explain things in terms that make sense to someone who studied classical music. Um, but it's almost like better that you don't overthink it. I, I didn't learn very much. I mean, it's, it's really complicated. Uh, the authority I, said it's best left unsolved. Yeah. Yeah. It's best, it's best left unsolved. It's just a little globule there on the, on the throne. Right. Um, I remember yeah, one time a, a flamenco t um, dancer taught me this flamenco counting method. It was like, it was in six, but it was like, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, it's six. One, it was, it's, yeah. it's 12 and it starts on uh, 10. Yeah, About right. 10. It was uh, so bizarre. <laughs> wait, wait, I remember now. Hang on. I can't remember now, but it's groups of twos and threes. And it depends right. on the vibe that they're going for. But there's accents, mm -hmm. there's hits on certain ones. I, I actually remember those classes, and that's completely escaped me. But uh, I'm, I'm, I hang out with a guy uh, who's um, uh, American, uh, but has lived here for like, I don't know, 20 years or something, a guitar player. He's one of the absolute best guitar players I've, I've ever known. And he, is, he plays flamenco, like he destroys playing flamenco. He had his own um, show for maybe 18 years in Malaga, which is hard to have your own show where you're like, you've got your own stage and your own place. Uh, incidentally, totally. it's called Kerite, and it's spelled just like your name, but with a K, and with an accent over the last E. Um, he doesn't do that show anymore. He's working on a bunch of other stuff, and uh, but he's amazing. And he's kind of really integrated into the whole into the whole scene, but when he speaks Spanish, you can kind of hear how he, he, learned, he learned Spanish more from like where he learned it from, but then he says dude when we're talking so he's you know he's as american as he can be but he's been here so long he mixes english and spanish in basically every sentence i was just nice. over at his place the other week working on some 
just writing some music with him. Um, you might want to you might want to look him up. I think he'd be a cool guy to interview. Um, yeah, give me He'll his name. All about that stuff. Yeah, give, uh, what's his name? Shane Gonzalez, but I actually don't know. I think he's changed his his thing, his artist thing on Instagram. It's gonna be. Bio Blues Pro Production, so P A Y O. Can you type it in the chat? Oh, I don't know. Can I? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. If you, you, if you type it to me, a, um, the creative Layo, Blues, exchange guys. Yeah, that's that's Pro. you and me. Those guys, they're always cool, and they'll just they'll find the link and put, they they already said to follow you for upcoming things. You know, I'm glad you sign in by the right. You signed up all your stuff to um. To uh, so. Creative Exchange, you made a profile, right? Yeah, yeah, I've got videos. Cool. And stuff. Yeah. His old show. Cool. Was so anyone watching, if you wanna, okay. There you go. Um. Yeah. No, he's. Wait, a... What's what's? Kelipe? Is that my name with a K? It is, but he's got an accent over the last E, and I, I don't remember the keyboard shortcut to do that. Oh, okay. Actually, okay. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> there I am on his Instagram feed. Yeah, because we I was over his place last week. Uh, writing. He's starting to get into looping and he's doing all this crazy stuff. It's really, really, really interesting. There's not a lot of it online, Ooh. but um, he's, he's the kind of guy that, like, I want him to come play at my wedding, like, level, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and playing at a musician's yeah, wedding. Yeah. That's we gotta, cool. You've got to be pretty, pretty baller. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, speaking of, of, of meeting musicians, I mean, I, I wanted to kind of get a chance to, to roll way back. Um, I guess we could start at the beginning. What were the what was the first thing that made you want to play an instrument? Uh, I think it was when we were in. I don't really remember elementary school that much. I mean, at least not when we were in Staten Island. I don't remember that much of that. I remember elementary school in New Jersey, and that was when they gave us like the recorder, and they gave us all the little what you call it, the little drums and shakers and stuff that they give kids. That's and usually third like, grade. This was like third grade, I think. That was when we moved to New Jersey. And I was like learning uh, Hey Jude, I think, was one of the songs in the book for some reason. And dad was obsessed with the on Beatles. A, and so I would like learn. On the clarinet? I mean the, the, the recorder. recorder? Yeah. And I would learn melodies Ooh. by ear and play them on the recorder. I wouldn't really, you know, because they taught you like three blind mice or whatever. Hot cross buns, yeah. The hot cross buns. But I, um, obviously you can make more than three notes on that thing. And so I was like, well, I can hear what the melody is supposed to sound like. I, would, I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew I could make a sound like something. I could just match the sounds. So as far as I was concerned, it was like, I hear a, a sound and I'll match a sound. I remember even standing up in lunch, the lunchroom one time and playing and I don't think anybody cared but uh, I was like ready to put on a show. And then, um, right. so as soon as we got to middle school, that was when they, st fifth grade was still part of middle school at the time. That was when they had like instruments and I was, I couldn't wait to sign up to get an instrument. And incidentally, uh, Greg Powell, who played trombone, whose parents were in like the Philharmonic or whatever. Um, yeah. He's very sure of himself. And, uh, you know, your memory is a funny thing because you the more times you remember something, the more you make it up. But what I think I remember is this kid standing there like this and going, you look like a trumpet player. And so I said, okay, and that was it, trumpet. Trumpet it was. And so I learned the trumpet and I excelled super fast. Like I was, I just obsessed. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't get enough of playing music. Uh, I still remember going, walking home with you after school and pulling the trumpet out. Uh, to show you outside of that uh, like daycare thing. And I didn't, right, I could right. make, barely make noises, but it was just so See, that's cool. what's funny because I remember that too. And I remember it was, I think you'd had the trumpet for two weeks and they finally let you bring it home. You'd only got to play it at school or something. It could have been. And I, I was home. That was so a big deal. excited. Yeah, I was, I was, I remember being so excited that you had this instrument. I couldn't even get home without seeing it. And you were like, no, I'll show you at home. And I remember stopping there. It was like the midpoint. I said, you can't go home without me. I'm not moving till you take it out. And you took yeah. it out and you played like three different notes. And of course, like a 
like a fool. I thought that all you were doing was pressing the button and blowing. I had no idea of embouchure or any of that. And you said, it's not that easy. It took me a couple of weeks to get this. Like, oh, it looks easy. And I tried and I couldn't even get any sound, but my head yeah. got all lightheaded. And at that moment I went drums. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> yeah. It's just, you know. I was, I, I really liked it. I remember I was always like the best kid in the class. And I remember one of our kind of gauges for that was that I would play with the older kids. And then also that I would, we do long tones. That was like probably my yes. favorite game we would do. Um, and we would do long tones and I could go for like, I think my record at the time was like a minute and 15, which now that I think about it, blowing what, what, a note sorry. Out, about a minute 15 of holding a note out. Okay. And considering that's exhaling and I was like, my lungs were like this big because I was like, I don't know, 12. That's pretty right. long. Um, I can still yeah. do, I can still hold my breath super long. But I think that that really, that lung training kind of came in handy later for when I finally started singing almost 10 years later. But one of the th the best lessons I ever learned, um, Mr. Campanella was his name. Classic, like Jersey. Oh, Italian. yeah. That you know, guy he was great. Was about, this would have been 1995, I guess. Naughty five. Yeah. Naughty five. Right. Mr. Campanella would have been about 362 at the time. Right. So, uh, you know, God rest his soul, wherever he may be. But he, uh, he taught me a very valuable lesson, which was that uh, besides that, he just let music be fun, which was the number one thing. It was just enjoying yourself. The other one he taught me was uh, if you have homework and you want to practice, you go home and you practice first because your parents will let you stay up late doing your homework, but they won't let you stay up late practicing. So <laughs> I still take that philosophy to things that I do. I genuinely still do that. And I think, okay, there's the things that I have to do and there's the things that I want to do. I'm going to do the stuff I want to do first because no one's going to tell me I can't do the things I have to do. They'll always just let me get away with it later. So uh, I, I really stuck with that since I, that, I mean, now it's been, what, 25 plus years since then and wow. that one stuck with me uh, that's so funny one, because the, the i have the opposite thing. thing what's that really yeah no no for me it was like it wasn't eat the dessert first basically is the idea you know have your vegetables later and so it was kind of musically it was it was always it always felt that way although i was never a massive massive practicer either i only ever played because i liked it i wasn't right big on training so much um, right I, think I remember you always being like, really natural with things. You would pick up things always yeah. very naturally. You still do. I remember you came over and played drums and, you know, you just, which is, which is why I remember, because I've always struggled learning new things. I think the only reason I ever got to another level is because of just sheer determination met with a bit of obsession because I knew I could do it if I just worked on it. And I knew I wouldn't do it if I didn't work on it. But I remember having the opposite philosophy. I came home on Fridays and did my homework immediately. Because in my head, that meant I have no other obligation between Friday evening and Sunday evening. And all I can, all I, and I, that would mean a solid two days of me getting to do my playing. But I remember also to this day, I think that, you know, I try to be in front of the work because I never liked doing it. So I just wanted to get it out of the way so it wasn't looming. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, it's it's you're right. When when you were doing the stuff in the trumpet, I remember you 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 were excelling excelling quickly. But I think the key reason was because you were enjoying it. Yeah, and what's what's funny with most instruments is I feel like all the all the more let's say accomplished in, uh, people I know who play an instrument, most of them, not all, but most of them, at some point realize that it's going to take a certain amount of work to allow them to have a certain amount of fun. And when they could yeah. keep that in a balance, then they just kept moving forward. And I think that's where, where music, unlike sports, really is a self-contained um, path. You know, you, you're only better than you yesterday if, if you work on it, but yeah. it doesn't matter how fast or which way, because unlike a sport, again, you can't really measure it. Uh, I feel like, for example, I think I play much more like myself now than I did before. Whereas maybe before I might have been able to pull off something a little more intricate 
because I worked on it more. But yet, only the important pieces are still in my play. So I don't think I've lost anything. Maybe there's just some yeah. things I worked on just to work on, and I don't really use them. So the things that I really needed, I, I it enables me to kind of reach further into the music and less into what I'm doing because that's yeah. already kind of the mechanics are there. But, you know, I uh, didn't want to bring up, I've been, I've been practicing guitar pretty diligently for the last few years. I started teaching it. And, uh, yeah. and I remember the reason I started drumming was because that was the instrument that really, you know, seemed interesting. But I very quickly realized I didn't want to take, first I knew I, I, I needed lessons, you know, because I didn't know what I was doing. And I was really lucky to have a good teacher. Um, and then all the while you were playing trumpet at school, um, I guess because I was in high, I was a freshman in high school then, and then I just started high school and you were still in middle school. And I realized quickly I didn't want to play drums on myself. I wanted to play in a band. The whole reason to play an instrument was to play in a band. And so I talked to all my buddies that that winter into getting guitars for Christmas. And by the by the leap year, like right two months was leap year, we played our first show. We played the talent show. But I remember those two months. Number one, I was completely obsessed with having our own songs. And I didn't know how to write anything. And I only knew certain things on the drums. So I wanted to write something that would allow me to do those things I learned on the drums. Um, and because my friend had left his guitar, or maybe you found our mom's guitar, there was like a, you had a poster of like finger positions, a chord chart, a chord chart. Yeah. yeah. And you started teaching yourself. So I remember bugging you to teach me first because I wanted to know what, what the chords look like backwards so that when I was playing, cause I would play really loud and I couldn't hear anyone. If they went for a D chord, I knew what part of the song we were in because they've changed chords. Right. And then, but then you started showing me how to play them because you were figuring them out and I was really yeah. slow. But the first song I wrote, you know, which was terrible was with one finger and it was basic, the basic chords when I think about now is it was E and A. So I wasn't completely away from a, you know, a one, for progression, but still, it you know, it was just an excuse to go blah, 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 and play that one beat I knew. Um, yeah. And, um, but then I never really took the guitar super serious. It was, it was just like a, like a passing thing. And you started to like, just start playing more guitar than trumpet. And then before you knew, I roped you into a band a couple of years later that we were just playing covers. Do you remember yeah. all, all, all of that? Bando. Was that your first band? Was El Bando your first band? Uh, I guess so. Yeah, probably. Must I guess that would have been it. I haven't had that many bands. Oh, that's true. That's true. I tried I to count once. I, about ten years ago, I tried to count the song, the, all the bands I've ever played with. I lost count after six hundred names. Now, of course, some some I played one song, but still made the list. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's stupid how many. <laughs> but El Bando was I just graduated high school. I was going to the collective and that day in the morning, no, I guess I was still in high school cause it was right. We, we, we played yeah, the high school the show. in the morning. You and I said, okay, well let's start a band because you were learning rage against a machine and Led Zeppelin songs. Yeah. And, uh, and I remember you and me talking about it and, and, and then we asked our friend Jim Dalton who's a skater and you know, smart kid. He's a, He's a cop in Edgewater now. Of course he is. Of course he is. <laughs> the most Irish Edgewater kid from ever. Yeah, yeah. All all of his family are all cops. So cops and firefighters. Um, I mean, he, yeah. Even, like, even though, like even a, though you know, Dennis Leary TV show, like everything. Right. It's right. like that show, uh, Rescue Me. Right. Like even even though they um. Oh, thanks, guys. Thanks, Creative Exchange. Just put our Shane Gonzalez's info up. Cool. Um, oh, yeah. Um, so e even though those th those kids that we knew were like, you know, different, little different ages, I think what, what I had in common with them was the music stuff. Yeah. All right. Yes. Hello. Look who I'm talking to. Say hi. 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 How's it going? How's it going? He asked you. What do you need me to do? I just wanted this. What's this activation look? You I need... don't know what it is. Oh, this is restarting. Okay, give me a second. I can what do happened? it. I don't know. I'll fix it. I have about close to 20 passwords I've had to memorize with the numbers for all the devices. It's gotten ridiculous. So 
Um, so what uh, what I remember was, you know, I just said to Jim, I was like, hey, man, I know you you sing in a band, but my brother and I want to start doing a, a, something with like Led Zeppelin and, you know, Rage stuff, maybe Chili Peppers. And he said, uh, he said, yeah, I, I'd like to try. Um, and I said, but do you play an instrument? He goes, I only play a little harmonica. You're oh, in the yeah. band. Okay. Right. I remember yeah. saying, that's it. You're in the band. And then right after school. Cause I guess, cause they had another band and I felt, I felt, here you go, you gotta plug mm. it in. I felt oh, yeah. bad because it's still not cool to poach people, you know, like hang out with your buddies who's in another band and be like, Hey, you should join our band. It's a little, it's a little uncool sometimes. So I felt a little bad when I asked him to jam with us because he was in their one punk band with all the other kids and they were a real band cause they were punk. And, um, but you know, I, I was like, hey, listen, we just we just want to learn these songs, so it'd be different from what you guys are doing. And I said, yeah, I could I could try, sure. And then by the end of the day, John, who was a bass player, who didn't have a bass, <laughs> shows up. He goes, hey guys, I heard you guys are starting a band. Said, How'd you know that? He goes, it's all over the school. Can I can I try out a bass? Said, okay. He goes, great. And we'll have two people from Edgewater, two from, from Leonia. We'll call it El Bando for Edgewater Leonia Bando. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. You're in the band. And then we went to the grassy. Remember there was the grassy knoll? It's not there anymore because they built the extension of the school. But up at the top of that hill where yeah. all the smokers hung out, they called that the grassy knoll. I go up there and I hired all the other kids in the gang there to be in the band. But they were like, like Scott was head of security. No. Okay. No, Eddie Black was head of security. <laughs> who now? Who now owns his own plumbing uh, company? Yeah, he worked for, he, he worked for for uh, what was the one guy? I don't remember. Uh, Pazio or something, and then he he took over and he has something. Oh yeah, I don't know. whatever. Right. Um, Scotty was um was merch. Eric was the uh was the was uh costume design. Who's who's a tattoo artist now? And he's written. You remember Eric Blood? He's written yeah, two or three yeah. children's books. Of course he has. They're they good. Like They're man. good. I, I've ordered them. They're really good. He plays this wow. weird, it's like a cello, but it's bigger, but it's not quite a bass. And you hold the bow a backwards way. It has like six strings. I don't remember. Check him out on Instagram. He plays really well. He plays mandolin. He sings. He's really oh, good. Cool. Yeah. That, but his, 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 his children's books are great. Um, so you see, I, I, knew, I knew who I was picking. I, I, had, a, I had an eye for the, uh, for the talent. Um, and you know, it was a thing. And then we played the talent show and we played a yeah. whole set. Do you remember? We played like yeah, we five songs. That one. We did? We did stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We were supposed to play oh, yeah. the song. They cut us off and then we had the whole, uh, audience doing killing in the name with us. Right. Right. We did. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah. what I wanted to, uh, what I wanted to tell you this week, which is, I think just so funny is, so we played mostly rage songs, right? And I remember, and, and, and Zeppelin and uh, Chili Peppers, I wanted us to get to play Tool songs, but they were too hard for me to play on the yeah. drums. I couldn't play them. They're just impossible. Well, everybody, we fast forward 20 years. And then, I mean, you've been doing a lot of other music. Stuff, and I want to talk about that stuff too. But you ended up playing in a band from New York called Brass Against, who are kind of like a cover band. Because they play yeah. mostly you know, covers, but they have their own interpretation. And their main songs that they do are Rage Against the Machine songs and Tool songs. Yeah. Weird, and yeah. and whenever my friends find out that you sang with them, first they're always blown away, which I always say, well, listen, you know, he wouldn't have done it if it wasn't going to be good. And it sounds really good. Your, your Tool stuff sounds great. Uh, you know, and and I just said, well, Big Brother was right again, because that's that's the stuff that we were playing twenty years ago, yeah. um, and you've played some big places with with that music, yeah. which is just great that you could do that and did videos, and it's really exciting. And this last week, like two weeks ago, I got asked to join a Rage Against a Machine tribute band. Oh wow! Awesome. And the, yeah, and these guys they live like twenty minutes away. They're all first of all, they're not full time musicians. They're not. So they have day jobs, they have houses, they have families. So they're not bitter. They just love okay. Rage. They've seen Rage two, three times every time they come around. 
So they know the songs. And they're my age, like, we, you know, we have the same Dave Chappelle reference jokes. You know, that's how yeah. deep it gets. And, you know, they just know the catalog. And it's one of the only bands I could walk in and know every song off the top of my head because they don't have that many songs. They only had three albums, really. So, we, you know, we already have a set of about 13, 14 songs. We've played a couple times. And they're like, dude, did you have to, like, listen to this stuff? You know this stuff. Went, you know what? I didn't. I've always loved this music. But 15-year-old me is really psyched right now. But yeah. honestly, I didn't tell them this. The first time we played, some of the songs sounded pretty good, and some of them were okay. But the bar was El Bando. And it was like, you know, when we were in El Bando, we played the songs pretty good. We, Our people of the pretty song good. were pretty on. We entered a yeah. contest once for, for MTV oh, as, a, wow. as a Rage Against the Machine tribute band. So it's basically El Bando part two. Yeah, we, were, we weren't good enough to be on the show, but we weren't bad enough to be one of those bloopers that they put up of the bands that were really terrible. So we right. were like a safe, a safe medium. <laughs> right, right. And that band um, was fun. That was fun. But. Yeah, I actually, when I started playing out, so I, yeah, we started playing guitar around a little after playing trumpet, and I was kind of always going, going back and forth. And then I went to school to be to study music education and trumpet, and it was right. all classical music, and I was starting to write and starting to sing a little... And around 19, I started playing in the city. I was going to school at Temple in Philly. And then I would go back and I started playing and I really didn't like school. And I decided I wanted to just go off and start playing. So I started playing actual shows in, in the city by the time I was like 20. I wasn't even allowed to be in the places. I recorded my first album, solo album, you know, 11 song when I was 21. You were on it. And uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Time, music was a bit more, it, it was a bit more of the stuff where I was more influenced by at the time, the rock kind of thing, a bit darker and so on, the hours thing and whatever. But I would play acoustic shows sometimes and I would cover Sober by Tool on acoustic guitar. Oh, yeah. I would hit right, the guitar, I'd tune it, i put in an open detuning and I would hit it to the rhythm that the drums did So because I never played extremely technically, but I was always very percussive. And, right, right, uh, totally. And I remember a friend of mine commenting on how much I sounded like Maynard, and I thought, well, that's weird, because I don't sing like that normally. So I don't, I never really thought, I never associated it. Of course, I listened to it, but I never really thought of singing like that. And mm -hmm. then years later, uh, 10 years later, when I was about 30, I, I was playing out, and I was doing these kind of unannounced secret shows under the name Sam King, and I was playing acoustic stuff. And it was all when like Mumford and Stuns and stuff was famous. So that was the kind of music everybody was playing. Right. And so it's a lot more acoustic thing. And, and then uh, there's a lot of kind of soul type of thing coming into it. Um, and I ran into, I met this guy. I just happened to be playing and I wasn't really promoting anything. I was just showing up. I lived a block away from Rockwood Music Hall. I'd leave my house at the time. No, I was going to say it was a... I'd show up, I'd play, uh, I'd leave. I didn't want to promote anything. I was really at a time where I didn't, want to I had had enough years of playing out and getting feeling like I was getting nowhere that I just wanted to play for fun again like back when I was 12 so I would just show up and play I wouldn't talk about anything and I just go back home across the street or around the corner but one time I got to talk to this guy Brad who told me he had this uh, same, same he's a uh, maybe a couple years older than I am but he had the same musical influences growing up of rage and tool and we had this big conversation that I barely remember Fast forward to uh, a few years ago when I moved to Spain uh, from Berlin. I'd been in Berlin, I moved to Spain, and I had actually shared Brass Against uh, YouTube video of Killing in the Name because I thought it was so good. I thought, God, this is the, probably one of the coolest covers. It, it fulfills everything I want. It's got like a soul singer. It's got it's music I love. It's got classical music influence because it's all arranged by a jazz saxophone guy. I mean, it's... It's mm -hmm. every nerd thing I can think of, and they're all over 30, so this is great. You know, uh, it's not like a 12-year-old on TikTok, which didn't exist yet, but still, it wasn't that kind of thing. And I just thought, wow, right. musical, musicality level 10, 11. And so I sh had shared that because I thought, God, what a cool thing. And I was doing music completely different than that, but what a cool way to reinterpret a song. Um, no idea that I, that was the same guy. No clue. And so then I'm going back to New York. Oh. Maybe I still lived in Berlin at the time, come to think of it, actually, for this, for, for this part. Uh, but at some point, I was going back to New York, and I wrote to my, my old friend, Ryan Vaughn, who I'd played a lot with, who still knew everybody. He's a percussionist. Now he manages artists. He does a lot of stuff. And I said, hey, man, I got to do some kind of promotional 
work. Can you, uh, do you have anyone you know? He said, yeah, right. you should get in touch with like Paste Magazine, you should get in touch with this thing, and you should get in touch with Brass Against. And I was like, yeah, cool, put me in touch with whomever. At this, sta- at this stage, I had already done the record deal, and we were like recording the album that's out as Samuel Hope. And so my music is very different. It's pop and falsetto. Yeah. And, everything. and I thought, wow, this is cool. I get an email, and it's Brad, the guy from Brass Against. He, re- he knew me from New York, and he reminded me that he was that guy who I'd had this great conversation with about our mutual affinity for Tool and how he loved my voice. And I thought, oh, my God, cool. So they invited me. They said, do you want to do a, a Tool song? And I thought, well, mm-hmm. yes, I hope I can do that. I don't know if I can do that. So uh, the reason I'm thinking that Spain was part of this, because my memory is a little foggy, we have to check what year it was, was it was around the time when I was moving from Berlin to Spain, and I started going out on Tuesday nights. There was this, what they call a jam session, what I call rock and roll karaoke. So it's basically <laughs> all the local people who uh, don't write, they just play covers. You know, they, that's Which all part know. of Spain is this? This is in Malaga. So I moved here and okay. I found this bar that's called ZZ Pub. Like, yes, ZZ Top. And so they're open every, yeah. uh, every day of the week they have music. And on Tuesdays they had a, this jam session that started at 12, which means 12.30. And they would do two sets until 3.30 in the morning on Tuesdays. And so mm-hmm. I started going and I showed up and I said, hey, I'm a singer from New York. Can I play a couple songs? Yeah, yeah, whatever. And the way the style is here is you wait because until you know somebody – you're just, they don't care who you are. They didn't care I was from mm-hmm. New York. They didn't know who, they didn't care. So right. all well and good. And so I waited and waited. Somewhere around 2.30 in the morning, I finally got to play. And I right. played the Joe Cocker version of With a Little Help from My Friends. And oh, cool. naturally, they were like, this isn't a song we know because they're used to, they're 6'8", the whole thing they were just thrown off by. Because they're used to, it's all Chili Peppers uh, or or ACDC or like a few Led Zeppelin songs and it's always the same. Everyone plays the same '90s cranberries. Like there's they all live in a box and everyone in Malaga, everyone in Andalusia covers the same set of songs. It gets really old really fast. But considering sure. I've never seen it before, I was like, God, I grew up on all this music. So I did that. Right. And right. To for them, it's quality. for them it's foreign music technically. Yeah, I sing that. Everyone freaks out and naturally I'm like, okay, I'm. I've got the audience now. I'm not going to stop. So I play the last chord. I get everybody all ready. They hit the last chord, and I immediately go into uh, a blues. I just did Elvis Presley's That's All Right Mama, because I thought no matter what, they can't mess up the chords. And everyone went nuts. So I finished, uh-huh. and, then, uh, and then I got all the free beers I could ever drink, because that's how they pay you in Spain. And not money, just beers. Uh, so I should just that's, open that's, the beer shop. That's you- universal yeah and so they uh when the night was ending they were like they were like okay it's over but no no you come back you finish the night and i and i basically finished the night playing out i don't know led zeppelin songs i was standing on the drum uh, the bass drum it was nuts and so i started going there and i was exercising the muscles i never used before to like sing like if dave Grohl had robert plant's voice and sang led zeppelin songs I'm like scream. I was. I would sing the Pretender actually. Also, I would sing. You know, I had to do a song they would know, and I would just shred. And I never knew I could sing like that. So then, sometime around this time is when they invited me to do Brass Against, and I thought, well, yeah, I guess my voice can do that. I just never really tried to do it before. So I just said yes, uh, and I went for it. And David came and he helped me learn the lyrics because there's a lot of lyrics, and I was really. Nervous. Oh yeah, was, our brother David. I, you know, he 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 knows so much music. Yeah, and mm-hmm. it's it's by no by you know it's by no fault of our in, incessant um, influence, but uh, but yeah, I remember driving him around, and um, you know making him he loved Rage and good Guns and Roses when he was a kid, but yeah. I remember making him listen to Tool and Meshuga, and having him like count the beats because you know he didn't play he played a little piano remember he kind of piano lessons from six but I just kept trying to kind of give him. Just more music that he would kind of find was his own, even if it wasn't what I liked. It was at least just something different than what he heard on the radio. And I knew he'd kind of flipped to another to another um, p- part of his, I guess, musical interest 
when we were listening to a Meshuggah song and he goes, oh, this is my favorite part. This is the part where he says, Scourge. What do you, do you know the lyrics? He goes, oh yeah, it's right after the Terminator clockwork, clockwork part. How do you know the words? He goes, how don't I know the words? He's like, I got all my friends in the Meshuggah. That's so weird. And then, and then 10 years later, there he is with Thomas and Thomas is going, Scourge, when he's like two. So awesome. yeah. Yeah, yeah well, and, and, and when he when lyrics, he went to right. see you, he he was like, "Oh yeah, we got to work on all these lyrics. That whole stuff is hard." But David really likes all the you know, kind of the the '90s kind of harder, complex, heavy, proggy metal. Yeah, it was that's hard cool for trying to learn all those lyrics, and uh, and I was nervous because it was the first time in a while I played with musicians who were professionals. I mean, they've like these guys play with these guys have Grammys and stuff. I mean, they're legit, really legit yeah. musician and I was nervous and also I, I had watched all their videos so I didn't know them yet I mean I, I didn't even remember really knowing Brad and so I remember getting there and being like oh man I really got to bring my A game because this is this is a professional environment and so I was super yeah. nervous but it ended up being awesome it was super fun I had a blast it was in the um what's that studio I don't remember the massive one with all the wood everywhere yeah I yeah I um Avatar Avatar. I wish we could yeah, have yeah, been there again for the other videos, but it wasn't right. uh, it wasn't available or something, which right. is a shame no, because we went somewhere else, which was cool, but it really didn't have that that epicness of being in this huge room all together. And uh, you can see, oh, yeah, the oh yeah, a bit, which is cool. But it was oh yeah, I didn't know that. Cool. Yeah, so that That's became awesome. for a little while. I became the dude who sang the tool songs for them. Um, and, uh, or oh, the Maynard and, parts, because you even sang the Maynard part on the one. Yeah. I know you're in it. Yeah. Yeah. Which uh, we play now, by the way, in my, uh, my rage band is called, um, Township Rebellion. And, uh, and good name. Yeah. And of course, you know, we, the guitar player used to work at a guitar shop. He could build anything. He was a website guy. He fixed some cables for me, he fixed an amp, you know. The bass player is a local chiropractor guy, plays really well. Um, and then the singer is a jock who never sang in a band, but knows all the words. Awesome. Just like my other, I even had another one. I had one for a minute. Remember we played the Cresco Talent Show, it was called Stone Cold. That's how you know when it was around, during that like, the era of Stone Cold, the the, the Austin guy. And um, yeah. Did I ever tell you that we played that talent show in Cresco and they had a mosh pit on stage and they broke the leg of the piano. So they didn't allow them to have a talent show again until every member had graduated. Wow. It was like two years, two, three years. They wouldn't let them have a talent show. <laughs> That's so, and that band was, that band was pretty good, but we only played three or four songs. So yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm remembering now all those things that you, that you do with Brass Against because it, you were like their like their call this guy to do the Maynard parts guy. It was cool. I mean, because they were doing really well, so they could they could afford to fly me back uh, home. Right, was, right. Yeah, you shows, weren't even in my own shows. I could do some shows with them. We did a couple in Germany, uh, which was pretty cool. Uh, we did a couple in like I don't know. I did a, like a mini part of their tour in Baltimore and Washington D.C. Right. And, uh, Exactly where, and then the biggest one that I got to do with them because they got the gig while I was still kind of doing shows with them was the O2 Arena opening for Lenny Kravitz. That was pretty crazy. Uh, that was crazy. It was cool. Yeah, it was. It was. It was a, obviously the biggest stage I've ever gotten to sing on. So was it was cool. full. Was the room full? Well, when we played, no. I mean, we played so early. It was a bit. It was like we were the opener for the opener. It was kind of funny because it was us and then Corinne Bailey Ray. And then Lenny Kravitz. So it was like really taking people on a roller coaster of, of right. uh, moments there. But, yeah. uh, I've and Lenny seen... probably plays for like two hours, right? Or something. He played a long show. They were, they're, you know, they're like real pros. They know exactly, every move is planned. Every surprise is, is part of the show. You know, when Scripted, you walk through right. the audience, the whole thing is choreographed. But That's uh, cool. they're great. I mean, they're musicians. They're, they are, you know, they're the Letty Kravitz band. They're gonna be they're gonna be monsters. And he's a very good guitar player. And so it was really cool actually to get to see him. Yeah. I was I was the closest person in the show. It was me and the security guys. Nice. Uh, and then I always wanted to be behind me. So that was pretty mm -hmm. cool. Because I remember listening to him when his songs came out when we were kids and I couldn't play the guitar parts. They were too hard. They're too riffy. Yeah. Yeah, they're very riffy. But he doesn't play his solos on album. He plays everything else. He doesn't play well, he doesn't play strings. I don't think he plays horns. 
He plays no. the drums, and I've I've actually hung out with his bass player, and he said the funny thing is he'll outsource other instruments, but he said even if it's going to take him five times as long, he insists on playing the bass. He said, "How long have you been playing with him? Oh, I've been playing with him for ten years, but it's just a thing he wants to do. He loves playing the bass in the studio. He yeah. almost sounded a little frustrated, like." If it wasn't Lenny Kravitz, I wouldn't even bother because it's not like it's a great gig. But, you know, it was like he he he's, he know I bet at this point, maybe he's let other people play it. But it is an amazing thing to watch somebody who can play all their instruments, not play all their instruments with the accent of another instrument. I mean, I can hear in the drumming that he's that's that's, that's not his first instrument, but he also has a certain style. That has a little bit of a swing to it, where it, it sounds like that could be a drummer from the '60s, you know, playing it. But his yeah. sound is amazing. Um, I mean, I think Slash has played more solos on this stuff. But Craig, the guy he yeah. has, who I always thought looked like Slashio Bob, that guy's amazing. Yeah, that guy's still there. He played a couple of songs on drums at the show, and it was it was solid. I mean, it was all really like everything was very where it needs to be. Uh, there was no, right. there were no surprises. There was no like, right. oh wow, that's that's you know, it sounds exactly like the albums. His voice right. sounds just as young as ever, and he knows right. all the moves. And he has the cool hair and the whole thing. I mean, really, is yeah. like the whole thing. It, awesome. I, it's amazing they can keep replicating that and not get bored. Actually, because it's just so accurate all the time. Um, right. But uh, well, well it was really, that, at a, the really high level it was pretty amazing. That brings up a good a good. Uh, point because something else I wanted to kind of, you know, ask you about, uh, which is just, it, it's, it's, you know, it, it can be interpreted several different ways, but what do you think are the main reasons why you do more, I guess, not, not counting necessarily brass against, but why have you decided to do more of, let's say your own music versus play for other people? Cause you could have done that too. I mean, you did, I used to play for the Davy Jones band for like 11 years and there was a stint in the middle where you were playing guitar and singing and Davey would ask me how your music's going. And I'd say, oh good, you know, he's playing coffee houses and learning to sing, he did school stuff. I don't even remember if you were still in school, you were really young. And and then he said, well, who would he want to come sit in with us? And uh, I, I don't know, I guess so. So you got a paycheck, you learned all the backup vocals, you learned the rhythm guitars. We didn't have, it was a typical pro thing, we had no rehearsal. You just were expected to know the songs, show up at sound check and be cool do the gig and go home. And, uh, and you did it. In fact, I think there was one time where we played a Beatle opened up for us. Pete Best band. Remember? Yeah. Really count. It does. He was a, he was a Beatle. That's still cashing in off that one. Oh, well, that's the only reason why he had a tour. Take it if you can get it. No, I, uh, yeah, but you did it. And then I just, I just like writing my own music better. I just yeah. don't, I don't really like playing other people's music unless I absolutely love their songs, but I always do it my own way and I never do it the same way twice. And right. I just can't, it's too boring. Uh, even if uh, there's music I think is way better written than my own. I just, to do, I just have to do what I do. Like I, I kind of, I don't know. I, it's just not me. So doing the tool stuff was pretty rad, but I couldn't do it forever i mean i did a couple i did like three i think and a half and that's plenty for me that was more than enough right. to satisfy that that you and wouldn't then do a final scale. Scale to a jam and i'll sing a leads up I'd, i'll do um sometimes when i when i show up at a jam i'll do an e minor medley and uh and everybody loves that the song superstition and so i'll just kind of do a, a choppier kind of i don't i refuse to play the riff the way it goes and so i'll mess with it and I'll do it slower and more like get like a groove to it. And then I'll stay there and I'll sing whole lot of love over it. And it's awesome. And then if I'm really, if it's working well, then I go into like a couple lines of American woman. And I don't remember what else. So one time one guy caught what I was doing and he also sang and he's like, no, no, I got one too. And I think we did about seven or eight songs that were all the same song all yeah. over the, the foundation of basically jam riffing over superstition. And then when you want to get out of it, you just do the change to the, the turnaround, to the B. And then, right. uh, and then at the end, I just play the riff and I sing. All of the melodies match each other where you can say all the melodies one after another and, they, uh, and it's as if it's one line. So it's actually kind of fun. So if I'm going to do covers, I'm going to kind of do something weird and different with it. Right. Uh, I do a pretty mean um, 
Dancing in the Dark, actually, also, incidentally. I do a different version. I do my own kind of version of that. Um, right. But uh, I've been told that uh, Sophia says that Logan Davis asked a question in the chat. Oh, I'm sorry. I haven't checked the chat in a little while. Let me no, go back. No, it's yeah. okay. Yes. Is live yeah. music back in Spain after the lockdown? As a musician, right. did you discover anything new during the past year? So to answer Logan's first question, music's kind of, yeah, it's kind of starting up again. Like I just played at a beach bar last week because uh, the weather's always good so you can be outside. So right. they allow a certain amount of people everywhere and everybody's vaccinated now, but I still, uh, I don't really do anything indoors. I'll, I just stay outside and I, kinda, I bring my own mic and nobody's allowed to touch it and I kind of keep my, keep my thing going. Um, but that's just the odd, the odd thing. I, I think there's a lot of, I see a lot of people are playing out though. Um, I just don't mm -hmm. really know much about it. But then to answer your second question as a musician, did you discover anything new during this past year? Well, so I, I wasn't home for the lockdown. I went to the Philippines and got stuck there for four months with Carly, my fiance. And so we, uh, while I was there, actually, you guys should check it out. Um, I don't know if you can throw a link up there. If you look up yeah. Samuel Hope TEDx Malaga, uh, I do a 15-minute presentation with some songs, and I actually talk about this. It's, you might find it really interesting. I thought it was pretty cool the way it all went together. And one of the things I touched on was the name of my, my presentation is Limitations, an Essential Tool for, me, for Creativity. Uh, because I've right. never been a very technical player and I've never desired to be. Um, but I am a very creative person and I'll just do, I've never bought guitar pedals. I never really, I didn't feel like I needed to have heavy distortion to play heavy music. I could play a tool song on acoustic, for example, and get the same emotion out of it. Uh, I would play percussion on my guitar because it was, and I'd put a shaker in my sock because I yeah, knew I, I could feel yeah. more sound by myself without having a loop station, uh, where a lot of people would do it that way. Now, eventually, when I was in the Philippines, uh, my only instrument was my iPad. And eventually, I borrowed a guitar from like a coffee shop I made friends with. But it was really bad. It was like a toy. And so I wrote music on my iPad, and I would do like one-minute songs of whatever came to me. I would just start making sounds, and then I would just see what, what came to me. And I got all sorts of different, cool different stuff. And one of them actually turned into an actual song that I wrote later when we got home. On piano, mm -hmm. and I play it in the in the performance. I started on the iPad and I finish it on piano, and it's the song I wrote when I found out uh, that we were that we were definitely going to have a baby. We wanted to have a baby, and when I found out, then I, the song just came flooding out of me. It was awesome, and it was cool. originally the the track was written after Bill Withers died, who I love Bill Withers. And, oh yeah, uh, yeah, that's awesome. And I wrote kind of like one of the things that came out of my iPad that that week of in in Lo philippines lockdown was uh mm -hmm. the foundation of the song that ended up being coming a song I, I actually still have yet to record and release but uh there's the only version of it that's out is that tedx performance mm -hmm. how did that tedx thing happen how did that come around uh i've played around enough i guess in malaga that people heard about me uh somehow uh, i'm a bit different from everyone else everywhere i go i'm always like Especially here, everyone wants to sing in English, but they you can tell them that's not their first language. Same in Germany. Uh, and here they all do covers, and I don't, really. And so I, I kind of stand out, I guess, as a bit different. And I had been playing uh -huh. enough shows, I don't actually know where they heard of me. I suspect it was because I was playing in this little tiny venue where um, that's like an art space where they do music and theater and whatever else they'll do. It's really small. It holds maybe... 60 people, like Rockwell, like packed. And right. uh, I started a residency there because that's always been my move, is play in the same place over, Jeff Buckley style, play in the same place every week or every two weeks and people will just come. And it works. It's amazing. And right. I think they heard about sense. me through that guy. I don't really know. But someone from TEDx contacted me for doing it last year. Then it got mm -hmm. canceled. And then when they decided they were going to do it um, online this year, uh, they invited me to do that, which... I'm really happy I did. I'm a bit bummed that it wasn't with an audience because it was a bit weird that there was nobody there to react when I was doing things. And I'm much more of a live performer, uh, and I kind of need the audience for that. But uh, mm -hmm. but it was still really it was really cool. It's great to say I got to do a TED presentation. I mean, that, that's
that's pretty wild. Yeah, it looked really good. The sound was cool. The whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, the link is in the is in the uh, the creative <laughs> exchange thread. Sweet. I feel yeah, so silly cool. when I say the YouTube things because you know my kids are um they're they're genuinely at the age where we probably were watching superhero cartoons. They're watching YouTubers, and so I was re reminiscing something with Jane the, the other day. We were both we were driving back from. Oh, this is kind of funny. Uh, I started doing videos over the last year. You know, I got like a MacBook, uh, an iMac or whatever, and I started learning Final Cut. But I needed like an excuse, you know. So I started doing some videos, and then I ended up doing this project with my friend, you know, Steve, Steve Geller, Stevus. He um he started writing these songs uh, under this like idea uh, called the the pandemaniacs who wrote these parody songs or, or or you know shtick themed songs about the the, the pa pandemic and i did the videos and uh, i also did some live like kind of studio live in studio videos for another band the world inferno that i played in and um anyway they submitted one of ours to a festival to a film festival up in nyack where steve is from and on monday Jane and I went and they, they, they viewed it. We didn't, we didn't win anything, but it was just like, my name was as director, which is like, oh, that's cool. Because oh, that's mom, cool. yeah, because our mom used to say that that's what I was probably going to do as a kid. Like before I played an interview, she said, you're going to like direct movies or something. Because I used to direct our Batman and Robin movies. Yeah. We dress yeah. up. We made our own costumes. We had fight scenes, and then I would ride like the car with a with a with a camcorder. Well, my kids are doing something similar. The other day, they wouldn't let me watch it. They, I could, they, I couldn't be in the room. So I was just, you know, one room away, like reading a book. Because of course, I don't have my phone because they're using it for the camera. And they set up their table, and we put a wall of cereal boxes. And they had this, it's this um, making slime contest or something that's really hip right now. And YouTube kids love making slime. It's disgusting, but anyway, um, so so they're doing their their little thing. But what's funny is I'm always kind of picking at how much all the YouTubers all say the same things. And I'll, if they want to, they, they really want to have their own YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. And they all want to have their own YouTube. They both want to have their own YouTube channels. So this is, so I've been letting them practice, but every few days they have some kind of content, content idea. I let them use my phone and I say, okay, well, under five minutes. Sure. And 20 minutes later, I get this thing where they're just talking, you know, and they, 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 it's funny. The minute you press record, Bella gets really nervous. And she just says everything that she's thinking. Uh, and so so what I want to do soon is start editing them with them so they can really, you know, make their own little videos. Because they do have content they want to make. And I think it's creative. I don't want to. The last thing I want to do is is shoot it down or make fun of it. Yeah. But there are parts of it that we take collectively laugh about. And the one that, that was so adorable, and Jane and I listened to this on the drive back, was one part Thomas uh, Bella, Bella was, you know, doing her little. Hey, what's up, guys? We're gonna be doing our slime challenge. First, we're gonna do our, you know, um, what was it? Uh, rock paper scissors. Choose who goes first. So they do the little rock paper scissors thing, and then, and then there was a glitter, like container with different glitters that we got, and she couldn't open it, so she had to go and ask me to help. So, she, and I don't know this what's going on. I'm just in the room. She comes and gets me, and I watch the video. And in the video, you see Thomas turn to the camera while she's doing, it, and he goes, "By the way." If you want me to win, go to the comment section and hashtag toxic is the best. <laughs> I'll put a link into my, into my YouTube channel. The link will be in the description below. But check that out after you watch the rest of this video. I was like, wow, that's that's very very pr promotional of him. Here and here and here and there and there. <laughs> it was so funny to listen to because he went into a different voice I've never heard. It was like his YouTuber voice. But uh, but no, I think it's adorable. I've been trying to help them also. Like Thomas composes, like you're saying with a computer. Thomas has, I think, three different programs he uses. He's got one on his iPad called Pixie Tracker, where he can sample sounds. And I've oh, caught cool. him downstairs. I'll be like, boink, what was that? I go downstairs and he's sitting there going, doom. Thomas, what are you doing? You ruined my take. Okay. He he'll sample my drums or he'll sample other sounds and he'll put them in to this little gridded um, thing and then he'll play it. But he loves polyrhythms. He's been doing these weird ones where like you think it's in four, but it's actually in six. He likes stuff like that. Yeah. And you cool. know, what's that guy, J Jacob something? That guy with the perfect pitch Ollier? that does like, yeah. yeah. 
He really digs that guy. So he oh, does something. Like, oh, he was crazy. He's like next yeah, level. Yeah. He's yeah, alien. really, really. Yeah, That's, really crazy. I, I think he's like, I think he's like Stevie Wonder in a way. Right. Stevie Wonder was a little easier to understand, but he was like a genius from, from right. childhood. And somehow right. managed to get that genius into a place where it can be in everybody's house and, and people can accept, like, can, it's accessible. Jacob Collier right. is on everyone's album and everybody famous is on his album. But then you listen to yeah. it and you're like, whoa, hold on, I need to, I need to listen to this about 400 times and then maybe I'll start to get it. Um, yeah, there's but so I think many he's layers. Becoming, he's getting more and more understandable, even though he's does, he does things in such a crazy advanced way. It's very complex, extremely high Amazing. information music yeah he does and Thomas videos is, where he tells you everything he did he tells you all his tricks right and you, right you still, that's, I mean you still have to have a brain like that to make it but uh, right yes yeah, really right. interesting yeah that's kind of the next stage I've been trying to get Thomas into because he'll sample his voice he did this all on his own he didn't see someone do it and one time he played me something I had like a seven part harmony so how'd you do that he says oh well I sang the first the first chord each note and then I just transpose it to make the next chord and then he just ship pitch pitch shift it. Oh, hello, look who I'm talking about, and look who I'm talking to. Hey, dude. So I was telling him how you did something with your iPad, and you you did all your voices, and then you pitch shifted it. Remember? Yeah. <laughs> On Pixie Tracker. Remember? And you sampled my drums. And stuff. We are not going to take that phone call. Um, what it was that? a robot. When it has my whole, basically my entire phone number except the last couple of digits, it's a robot. Do you want to show him something? Or do you want to send it to him later? I already showed him. Okay. I can show him now, though. Okay. You can show him. Um, so he's really into like viewing his electronic stuff. Um, but the one newest thing he's been doing is on, at night, sometimes this summer, he comes and helps me with sessions on, uh, on Logic. Like people, oh, cool. yeah, people send me music. Sometimes it's just a demo. Sometimes they have all the other instruments finished. All they need are drums, or I do drums and then percussion. For some people's demos, I'm recording bass, guitar, and drums because I have all the gear. And I can show him something I'm working on right now. Sure. Okay. And then, oh right. So he's got he's got programs on all the devices on his laptop. I'm waiting for them to come out with Logic for iPad because I've moved everything to iOS. I don't have a computer anymore that I, I mean, I have an old one, but eventually when we move, I'll probably get a, an actual computer, but I love the portability. I do everything on my iPad right. all the time. Yeah. And I, I was like that for 10 years with my, with. right. I had, I'm I'd been using the, the laptop so long. It became my normal full-time computer. It just told but, me that a, that a message failed to send. Okay. I'm almost 2.5 thousand days ago. Remember that time? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> which was um, almost, which is about the time my mom had an iPhone. That is before. Uh, but, <laughs> listen, listen to that. Listen to the beginning of that song, and listen to the percussiveness of his voice. It's it's so much ticks and bits and bit. It's basically scatting underneath his own vocal. But that yeah. one is is actually one that. You can really hear it. The production is so good. Even that opening synth sound. There's yeah. two synth. There's a there's a there's a modular synth, and then there's like an organ. And the minute you hear that first those first four notes, it's like the best production, you know, of that sound I think ever. And then just listen to the vocal. There's even a vocal out there where Michael Jackson sang all the vocal parts. I want to say it was "Beat It." He did a demo where he stacked all the backup vocals. So he wrote the song. Oh yeah. Oh, for, oh, okay, um, but yeah, Thomas has been doing something like that with his with his things, and so some nights he sits in. Like there was one session where he, I had a chart, and I can't play the piano. He played all the chords, and then we worked on some other songs with uh, you, Joel. We have our our drumming madness Tuss in his back. We've been doing some stuff like that, and then he he just recently started using live loops on um on Logic, and he's he's. See the? Do you have you ever used Live Loops before? It's I've in the got newer GarageBand iPad, and it's like a baby version, and they have Live yeah. Loops. They're really good, though. They're really yeah, they're good. really good. Yeah, well, he stacks them up, but then he also alters them. He changes their pitch. He, you know, he affects them. He isn't completely writing his own samples from scratch, but he's making them in his own thing. 
And then when he records it in as a song, it's a performance. So it's uh, much like the old days when people had to, they didn't have automation. So the mix itself was a performance, you know? Yeah. You had to have all the people in the room all turning knobs. So he, he's been doing things like that. So all this electronic music, I think is either, on the one side, it's very uh, danceable. Uh, Stop doing that. We're not, we're not doing uh, I'm talking about your songs. Are you ready? You ready to show it? You want to put it through an amp or you want to put it through a, a squid like that? I guess that's good. Enough. Okay, you can bring it over. So some of his stuff is very thematic, like, like, um, uh, <laughs> like, uh, what do you call the soundtracks? They're like soundtrack stuff. And then some stuff is more like dance tune kind of electronic. It's, okay. it's dance music. All right, Maybe. hit it. You want to hit it? Go ahead. This is Thomas's tune. Don't play all of it. Turn it up, turn it up. He hasn't licensed all his music. That's something I've been meaning to ask you about because he wanted to put his stuff on different websites. Oh, no, 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 not nothing, nothing till it's till you own it. Yeah. Right. I mean. Well. Yeah, I guess he just needs to have like a. I don't really know. I mean, I, I used to just do it. I would use a distrib digital distributor, and then they deal with all right. the stuff for you. Uh, right. That's what I thought. You yeah. tune core. Okay, you ready? Good. Yeah. Uh, uh, play something. Well, I made different songs, and I'm working on one where I just combine different parts from the song and just put it into one. Okay. What's it called? I haven't created the name. Okay. He's got really funny songs. Can you hear that? A Those are bit. two songs. Let me see if I can crank this up. It's as well as I can, it can go. Hold on, pause it. Pause it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it through put a speaker. It close to your microphone. Um, yeah, let's put it through this. I need the... Uh, I am in your chair. Here, Thomas, I need your uh, adapter. You, I need the quarter to eight. Hold on a second. Oh, wait, do you have quarter to eight? Or eight to, do you have eight to quarter, right? Yeah, that's good. Plug this into your, bring it over here. Right. Oh, you know what? Let's crank it through the PA. Okay. <laughs> All right, ready? Yeah. Okay, buddy. Turn the volume down a little bit first. It doesn't seem to want to play. Just... Try to play now. Try to tap. Hold on, we're coming. Probably the PA is loud. No, the PA is mega loud. Okay, let's try another way. Hold on now. Let's try another way. Come on, bring it over here. And if not, I'll just mic it. This is an impromptu performance of this, by the way. So, all right. Play. Okay. That works. Okay, kick it. It's only two. It sounds it sounds different in key sometimes because it's supposed to be in one key and it's in, and it's all in the same tempo, but it just came from different songs. So sometimes it won't sound together. It sounds pretty good. It used to be like one fifty five. It's a hundred. I see. It, it's a trick, what's up? They're pretty cool. I can't cool. hear it super well, but what I can hear sounds really cool. Well, he you he, he put two different song ideas that were made separately on top of each other so rhythmically no, put, uh, like 10 of them or oh, okay <laughs> it's like 10. one of the things i could but hear I'm there still adding more oh that's cool i've never heard it before either but 
there was one that was going dun 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 dun. That was like the rhythm, and the other one was going dun 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 dun. It was in three or six or triplets, but it sounded like you could hear the melody in that subdivision, almost sounding like it was in seven. So there was this polyrhythmic element, and that's some of the stuff he does. It's it's extremely complex, but it's high information music that he listens to. I have no input on his music. I don't change anything. Well, I don't write anything for it. I don't fix anything. The only thing I ever do is when I'm with him and he's using the MIDI keyboard, which we've affectionately well, named McLovin. Um, and he sits and he makes up things with all the sounds. It's sometimes I help him by quantizing stuff because, well, so you know, that can help make it. Well, well this mm -hmm. is faster than the song. Okay. And it's in the same key. Can you hear him talking? It's in the same yeah. key. Would you come closer? Come closer. Let's sit over here. It's in the same key. Okay. But it's a little faster than because well, it's the original song, and for some reason I don't know how, but I found where I just messed around with all the effects I can because it plays in like every bar. It's kind of like an effect loop. And then I somehow got an out of time beat. I don't even know how. I think it's out of time. Where's the quarter note? Is it there? Okay. Oh, I Good. You should send me these when you when he's got them uh when they're shareable. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a two against three in there. Well that kind of this, this kind of sound it sounds it sounds like a different sound yeah, than good. it actually is it's just a high-pitched electronic kick that i made its delay so fast where it's so fast it's the fastest it can go which is 164. that's fast the 64th wow. note that's fast yeah what's it it's delay oh that's like a brrr. you can't hear the stutter after after it but and he took the kick drum sound and manipulated it. So this it's a name. There's this kid on Instagram. He does like logic sessions and he'll he'll do covers. And I right. discovered him doing a really good cover of a Radiohead song. And he does oh, like cool. the backwards the backwards vocals. He just goes like <laughs> It's really really cool. I I can't remember his name. I started following him. You'll have I'll find him and I'll send him because I think you guys would like him. Um, he does everything. He plays all the instruments. He records all the parts by himself. Well, what's cool, really cool. I, well, what's cool that I found out is that if you like add in, if you like open up a window when it's playing, it actually muffles it. Which this is unmuffled. And then if I open the plus, and then if I open the plus instrument window, then. It's quieter and muffled. Dun, 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 dun. That's great. Really cool. Yeah. Well, I think I'm going to have to split pretty soon. Okay, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's okay. Good job. Have some dinner. So when you do that stuff at a shareable stage, definitely send it over. It sounds really yeah. cool. Yeah. Did you hear? Did you hear the emailed ones I sent a little while ago? Yeah, I've been listening to those. Those are really cool. Those, those were ones. A couple of them were performances of his with a live loop thing, and most of them were just his MIDI keyboard pieces that he would usually write some section of one instrument as like an improvisation, and then he'd write other parts over it. So most of those are like first takes in a way, which I. I I think is a good method because essentially he he's creating, he's not fixing. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. Like sometimes people create something and then they instantly try to fix everything to make it look like music. But music doesn't look like numbers. Music has to look like more than that, you know? Well, and I think for him, he's reacting to it. What he hasn't gotten a lot of chance to do is react to other people's music in, in real time, play with people. So I think that that's what I'm going to, I've had him jam a couple times with some of my friends' bands, but there's also, and uh, you know, I'm saying this because you're in the room. I think there's a real important need to remember that whatever freedom you want on an instrument, it takes a certain amount of discipline to just get the mechanics down, so that the mechanics aren't in your way. Yeah. You know, so that it's more fun. But you know, coming from an obsessive practicer to someone who, I, I mean, I feel like you spent a lot of practice singing and playing, but but you also were natural. You always look like you're natural about it. But I think the part is that people don't always know is when you look like something looks easy, it was probably really hard for a while until it became easy. And you only present yeah. it once it looks easy. So yeah. that's kind of where his, his discipline is on piano. He sends time in his class with a metronome and he's learning f Fur Elise now. You know, that's just stock yeah. stuff you got to know. But it, it should the creativity shouldn't even necessarily begin there. It shouldn't stop there, you know. Yeah. I think, and, and that's why I'm trying to encourage him to write in different formats because it's almost like handing a painter a bunch of different, if they only use crayon or only pastel, they're going to be limited. But they see more more things than, it, it, the more things you mix in, the more you're probably going to hear your own style come out of it because yeah. the rules are going to be bending all the time. Um, would you agree? I mean. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, so what's. So uh, how long how long do you have? We have like another ten minutes. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, what's I, up? Well, this is for affected sound, which you heard before. Okay. And then this is actually for real soundtrack without the affecting loop. Okay. Okay, it's cool. You wrote that too? No, I just took off the effects. Oh, I see. Okay, but you wrote that melody. Because I found it from a different song, which I actually made a different type of version yeah. of it. Because I thought the first one was not that good. That's cool. He's he's becoming quite a night owl, though. Oh, and I, I don't know how much you like to read it when you were a kid, but I didn't like reading. The kids love reading. No, I wasn't oh. a big big reader. Uh, but he they go to the library like twice a week. He reads. Oh, great. That's good. Eight or nine books in like two days, three yeah, days. I, it's crazy. I honestly don't even know where I got my vocabulary from because I was never a big reader, but I, I think I have a pretty extensive vocabulary. I think it's just because well, dad used a lot of big words. You also speak like four languages now, right? I mean, not really. I mean, I, I speak two well and then a third kind of like, all right, halfway. German? Yeah, German's my like kind of bit. Spanish has gotten really good, although I have a pretty thick accent. Um, but uh, I use it every Spanish time. accent or English accent? No, I like it's all mixed up, kind of. Oh, okay, so then you sound mixed. like that there too. I learn, I learn like I learn the way that people speak here, but then the way that people speak here is very particular, and it's not particularly nice. And then uh, I'm used to hearing the way that people spoke at home, and so it's kind of like a mix. Right. But um, no. also some of the vocabulary is a little different. But as I get better at it, I can play with it more. Uh, right, you know, where, like English, someone can say two words and I can tell you where they're from. In Spanish, I'm still getting. Um, wow, kind of that's cool. the name. yeah. No, mom and dad, I think, always had a little bit of an accent, but it wasn't like an accent because they weren't able to speak the language. They speak the language really well, but it's like there's a slight mixture in their accents that's their own accent. Some people would ask me before when they heard dad talk. Where they'd be like, "Is your dad from Europe?" I go, "Not really. Why?" They go, "Well, because no, he just says sometimes, wrong. It, <laughs> sometimes the sound of his voice is a bit of a mix." Daddy, can and I, anyone see that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that yeah we're we're online. We're, we're live. It just puts the emphasis on the wrong syllable. Yep. Definitely. <laughs> Though you know, I've I've recently discovered how much fun dad jokes are. Not recently, oh, I've, for a I'm while. Full of them. Yeah, I, I have them all. I'm like getting, I'm warming up. I'm still, yeah, I'm still you got, yeah. Back. Oh, oh yeah, I got plenty for you. Right. The other day, Bella says, why, why are they called dad jokes? Why aren't there mom jokes? I said, because mom jokes are funny, so they're just jokes. 
Dad jokes are only funny to dads. And she goes, well, then why do you have them? I said, because you need a victory, even a small. Yeah. And yeah, they're pretty bad, but they, I, I get them now. Um, and yeah. Uh, family, family gets on my case because I, uh, I eat like the bite-sized chocolates. I eat in one bite because it's bite-sized. And they're like, yeah, but you're, you're like a pig. You should, you know, chew on it or break it in half. I say, yeah, but it's bite-sized. It's one bite. Anything more right. than that is just food. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, man. Uh, oh, so we had some more comments. Uh, oh, people oh, said, cool. great job, Thomas. And uh, Rob says, well, he, he's, uh, he's ready for your single to drop. See, I told you, you're going to have an audience. <laughs> It's a pretty, it's a pretty extreme thing that, you know. See, that makes me want to weep a week. Or something. It's okay, you can go. Um, this is something that I think is is important as a as a, an artistic person who's who's also going to be a parent is that whether you know wh whether whether your kids end up looking like you or doing things like you're doing or not, I think the beauty in it is from an artistic standpoint. You're creating a custom human. So like a song or a thing, just do your best at every part of it and then let it live because that's essentially the same idea. Like I know I have to stop telling him to do certain things at a certain point because he doesn't need me to remind him anymore. But right now it's also just, it's con like I'm constantly on them about, you don't live in a restaurant, pick up your plates, like training, yeah. make your bed. Because I think those kind of disciplines are the kind of things that we carry through into the things we do. And I think a lot of the things that we're doing nowadays, you and me, that, that, that are, are you okay? Yeah. All right. I think a lot of the things that we're doing that, that, that parallel or that we're trying to keep a musical life going while having a family life. And they actually are the same. They're one thing. And a lot of people make them try to be separate. I think it's there's a practicality of leaving work at home, at work, and not bringing it at home. But there is there is a way you can have both, and I think that some people I've known have mastered that. So I just usually just talk to them about it. Whereas there's some people I've known who are masters at one thing and not the other, and they can't imagine doing the other, and that's cool too. But it's like it's like trying to play more than one instrument, you know, or speak more than yeah. one language. Yeah, you're not going to speak yeah. them simultaneously. But that doesn't mean that you can't spend time on one, you know. So I think it's the same. So if you ever find yourself in that situation where you're saying, I'm not practicing my instrument. I have to go do the dishes or do the babies. Up, you'll do it. But at some point, hopefully you'll find, you know, whatever balance is comfortable so you're not driving yourself nuts. Like my balance is I hate the dishes. If I don't get them done, they don't get done. But I watch YouTube videos on how to play guitar. So a lot of my practicing has gone into just watching three or four different instructionals on how to do a scale or something. And then later when they're asleep, I can practice it. But the mental part about it, I do, I do dishes cause it's mindless, you know, but it's yeah. stuff that has become a routine that I think when, when people don't have kids or they have like a pet, they're like, Oh, I, I got a dog. It, well, the dog's yeah. not going to look at you one day and go, please, you know, they're not going to do that. Yeah. Or they're gonna, you know, so there's a lot of those little things that as, as, as a musician, having been so dedicated to it for all these years, I know if, if you're looking at parenting that way, you're going to, you're going to do great and it's going to be easy and fun, or at least it'll be simple. It's not going to be easy. There's a different, you know, like playing a yeah. groove and not changing is simple. It's not easy though. You know, yeah. so that complexity comes with, with, with a discipline of just, you know, we're going to get you up every day and you're going to eat every day. You're going to, you know, and uh, you're gonna, you're just gonna figure out new things. It's just like an instrument. You figure out new things all the time. You go, wow, I, I, I've heard about this, but now it's real. Now it's not cliche. It's yeah. my experience. But you know, and uh, I still can't believe how many photos and videos I have of the kids. It's a, it's obscene. My phone is all of them. It, it's a yeah. camera with the kids that happens to work as a phone. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, it's, but it's, a, but it's a special time because. You only get it so long, and I don't regret not touring. I mean, prior to last year, I don't regret not touring endlessly. After Bella was born, I stopped doing anything long because you spend that time with the kids, they'll remember it, or at least you'll remember it. I remember growing up and thinking, oh, man, 
I get to see my dad on weekends, but he works a lot. And I didn't really get to, uh, to necessarily appreciate that time until now I go, well, you know what? I have to be there more because they're, they're at an age where they will want me to go on the school trip or they will want me to be at the school book sale or whatever. And in a couple of years, they won't care anymore. So, you know, they'll want me out. They'll want the Wi-Fi code, the car keys, and they're, they're, they're gone. But there's this little window, this little, you know, feels little now because it goes by quickly. So, uh, so I'm just anxious to hear more. And every time you send me a video, <laughs> you building something, I'll go, Oh yeah, I remember we had to build those. Oh yeah. The car seat, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and Jane Jeffrey always lasts. Like super. Yeah. Oh, so good. Everything's right. So nice. Right. Well, Jane had said that too. She's like, if Daniel's anything like you are with your equipment, you're going to have no problem assembling everything and figuring it all out because that became my new rig. Like my diaper bag was my rig. And my, my car, you know, like I would, I would try to break the strollers just yeah. to find their weaknesses, you know, no, not like, actively, but, you know, every, everyone in the family already knows that I'm going to, I'm going to have these attached to everything all the time. Hang on. I'm going to have one of these attached to everywhere and I'll be hanging stuff because I climb. So I always have gear and always, oh, right, right, right. I just got into myself a new backpack to fit my iPad for work and kind of, I've got my, where I clip my my water bottle and where I, you know, even, I even tied a, uh, an extra loop into my water bottle so I can hang it and I can right. clip it to stuff. And so I'm pretty much going to be, Luke, you're going to see me with a baby dangling, you know, repelling off the side of me or something like that. It's going to be right. clip, carabinered up. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think that's something we, we always had in common was, um, we get a goofy, like, like excitement out of being organized. <laughs> so. Yeah. So even if it seems a little over the top, that's definitely how I am. And I still drive the kids and Jane nuts. I'm like, no, you have to put the thing back in the same place or you can't remember where it goes. I have to be a speed that way. But, but you, you know, you also, the, the, all the rules go out the window too, because kids just need like patience. They, yeah. you'll, you'll find patience. You didn't even know you had. And I think a lot of it will, for me, it has reflected many times. I've gone, wow, mom and dad never were upset if I did that, so I shouldn't get upset. And I probably did that a bunch of times. Like how many times did they say, don't cry over spilled milk? And every time the kids spill milk, I go, okay, don't worry about it. It's okay. It's just an accident. We'll clean it up. You know. And now also all in a funny way too, having had kids, I've learned to teach kids. I have a lot of students who are beginners. Here's a funny one. I got a five-year-old. His name is Madison, and he loves a YouTuber whose catchphrase is, stay juicy. So we know him in the house as stay juicy kid, right? And yesterday, he's like falling asleep. He's half asleep in our lesson. He's tired. You know, he gets up early. His lesson's at 530. I said, Madison, you okay? He's learning. He was learning to play Pretty Woman, you know? And because um, I've gotten him off the video game songs and into like real drumming. And he goes, oh, I'm okay. I said, well, why don't we do this song where there's a part where there's a big break and in music, we call that a rest. And what do you do when you rest? He goes, I usually suck my thumb. And okay, well, <laughs> you get the idea. <laughs> That's like, very good response, Stay Juicy Kid. <laughs> yeah. Kids say funny <laughs> stuff, man. It's great. But that kid's going to be a monster drummer one day. He's five and he's playing. You know, it's pretty cool. I, I always heard three or four when I was. Yes, I know. I think I think Uncle Daniel discovered Thomas's perfect pitch when he was like three, mm. which is still fun because now Thomas can he can figure out pretty complex chords. I can play him a G seven chord. He finds a root, builds a chord, and he knows what it is. So we're still kind of pushing it, but um, uh, but you know he's having fun. Sometimes. So that's you are, that's sometimes good. Sometimes you ask me about something and I can just answer it correctly. That's true. That's very true. And uh, I'm hoping that as he continues to get more into music, he doesn't forget that there's an outside because now he doesn't want to go outside anymore. He just wants to stay inside and do music. But yeah. but maybe we'll get rollerblading. I don't know. And maybe mountain climbing. Hey, uh, um, da da David's been trying to talk me into that, and so is Joel. So great. One of these days, I'm going to need some. I'm going to need some tips. Go you on. know, which go <laughs> finger. I don't know. I don't know how you. You, it doesn't hurt your fingers for playing? Uh, no, it makes them stronger. Okay. Oh. At, at first, yeah, it's kind of weird at first. But then once you get it, then it makes them stronger. 
for sure. Right, I would think so. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, last thing I'll ask: Do you have anything, any music stuff coming out soon, or any stuff we should look out for? There is one thing that uh, is finally coming out soon, which is a Bose promotional video we did here at the house for a new, uh, the new L1 Pro 8 uh, tower thing, compact speaker. Now this and is so Bose, I, I'm sorry, this is Bose speakers and the whole company that does. Yeah, yeah. And, and you've done I, something I for them before, right? I did, there's on, on YouTube, if you look up, I think it's Bose, Samuel Hope Bose. I've done a couple things and there's a, uh, a little short clip on the bridge in Berlin, which was promoting one of their um, uh, street amps. There's like a whole interview I did with at a show in a, the biggest music store in Germany. Um, and then this is a new one that'll come out. I don't know when. Pretty, it just okay. depends when they want to put it out. Um, but it's uh, promoting the new L1 Pro 8. It's pretty cool. It's got one of my cool. new songs on it. And, uh, oh, good. Cool. Pretty fun. So that's. I just. I just. Uh, I just put that link. In the Sophia's um, on. yes, Sophia's on. I just put the link in the um message board there so people could check Sweet. that out. Hi, and okay, uh, awesome. yeah, and then I know you also had a, a live in one thing that people should check yeah, out. Yeah, if people go to my YouTube channel, I, I started a series that kind of got derailed by the whole pandemic last year, but I got five of them out of live performances that are done in one take, um, one camera shot, one musical performance. Uh, in places where you wouldn't expect to see a uh, recording done, being done. And there's all of like my iPad, a guitar, and uh, there's two that are my favorites. The first one, Running Circles, which was done on the top of a mountain, and another one called Without Warning, which was done in, a, in an abandoned factory. And that one's worth watching from start to finish because it really like has a huge arc. Um, oh, the, and, the, yeah, I, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. That, one, and, that um, song is on the album, but I did a, I did the live version I've always wanted to do. I finally did it on the, in that video. It's that's been cool. two hours. Well, Th Thomas had a question for you. Yeah. What's yeah. your question? Oh, we had a, he just asked, why do you use the name Samuel Hope for your music? Uh, I don't know. That might be another two hour interview, but I had the short version. I went through a couple different names. And then the funny thing was I ended up having to use a different one because in Germany when I signed the record deal and the publishing deal, they were going to put music out and everything has to be registered. And it was mm -hmm. actually just a copyright issue. So I needed a new name. Okay. It just boiled down uh, to needing a new name. And the music had changed enough that it was kind of a rebranding thing. Right. It's, okay. it's, it's something to do with brain. Right. Well, it's kind of like he has a couple of different monikers and self Thomas is his, his normal uh, name. He doesn't put out. We didn't put out anything uh, with the intent of using his own name either. You know, he's got his his T Tfinity is one of them, right? And then that's like his solo stuff, his electronic stuff. That we oh can't tell you any more of that. We we also have a metal band that he wrote that he he came up with no, a name, but, but I can't tell you any more than that. It's just very heavy. Oh, he's well, writing I stuff. Anyway. C -sharp, C -sharp. It's crazy. Keep your secrets. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, yeah. everybody, for being Thanks, on everybody. with us. And um, we look forward to our next opportunity to uh, see Daniel play and also our next interview on Creative Exchange. Uh, I will be on this Friday, as usual, Friday, New York time, 8 p.m. And uh, check out all the links we put in the description, and uh, we will see you guys later. Good luck with cool. the baby. We'll see you soon, bud. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Felipe. See you guys okay. later. Bye. Bye.